welcome to Crawl Space. I am Tim here today with Lance. What's up, Lance? How's it going? It's going great. We are talking about a really crazy situation. Like uh, this character that this book is about is just incredible to us. His name's Miles Connor. That's the book. The book is about Miles Connor. It's called The Art of the Heist, Confessions of a Master Thief. But we're joined by Jenny Seiler, who co-wrote the book with Miles. And she has a great story. I mean, she has several great stories about Miles um, that, that you'll hear, that you'll read about if you get this book. Uh, it, and it's highly recommended. Miles is the type of character that has walked out of, he's like a James Cagney, like an old like gangster movie, the gangster with a heart of gold, right? You yeah, know, yeah. You don't really like the things that he does, but he's got a code, which yeah. is really cool. And some of these stories are going to sound fake, but uh, Jenny has researched them and she has corroborated them and she to write to write this book in order to write this fantastic book that you should buy anyone who has any doubts that these stories have been elaborated on or or all altogether fake just just contact the boston police department and ask them what happened on the rooftops in boston in the 60s to to, to Miles. And the current police officers will ask their grandfathers about and, it. Right, and then the current <laughs> police officers. But what I'm saying is that this is the this is a stuff of legend. That yeah. Criminal legend that, that um, you know, Miles uh, and the crew that he ran with and his higher-ups and his, his peers, like, they, they created stories of criminal legend. So this is a one-off episode, and it's related to our other podcast, or I should say one of our other podcasts called Empty Frames, which is about the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist of Boston in 1990. And so when you look into that, you start seeing Miles' name. His name starts popping up. Almost immediately. Yeah, and so he's got some relation through association to the Gardner heist. And so that's why we had Jenny into the studio to talk in the first place was to talk about this book on empty frames which she did in episode three that aired this week and so we're matching the full interview which you're about to hear uh with the episode of empty frames with jenny which is about half of this interview right much like the book uh miles's name became synonymous with the isabella stewart gardner museum heist but that's a small fraction of his life and the the discussion that we had with Jenny was was far it, it reached further than just the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist, uh, and it's uh, the art of the heist. You can uh, you can go to our website crawlspacepodcast.com, dot com and you can purchase that book through Amazon there, and it's uh, you will not be let down. So check out Empty Frames if you haven't already. And also, we have a live show that we're doing in Boston, or actually more specifically a suburb of Boston called Somerville in uh, the lovely Davis Square where we've done a couple of shows there already at the Rockwell. So it's March 25th. It's a Sunday evening, 6 p.m., and we have Lori Bruno, psychic witch High Priestess Lori Bruno. Lori is a friend of ours from um, her work that she did sort of unwittingly with us on uh, uh, Moore's case. Um, you've been to her separately. Mm -hmm. uh, and for her to join us, she, she really is just a wealth of uh, energy. She's a, and I'm not saying like a, a, a wealth of, of, of energy, like she's going to run around the, the whole place, but she's full of energy. Yeah, she's a great person, really interesting, has lived a wild, uh, well, I mean, an interesting life. I mean, I think being a psychic or being, you know, offering your services as a psychic gives you an experience like a uh, few of us have. So just in general, whether or not you believe in psychics, that alone is interesting, I feel like. So, and that's where we're going to start. Absolutely. And if no matter how you feel about psychics, just to have the opportunity to be in the presence of somebody who you may or may not agree with, who might have some views and might have some abilities that you don't understand or you don't agree with, you can be a skeptic and you can go to the show and you can ask her questions. And that's a wonderful thing to do instead of uh, just wondering, instead of, you know, locking yourself away from it. Right. So links to buy tickets are in the show notes. So thank you very much. Hopefully we see you on Sunday, March 25th in Davis Square. So if you are one of the lucky people to have... Uh, subscribe to our Patreon, and you are now considered a patron of ours. Thank you very much. I hope that all of the material that we're providing to you has been entertaining and sufficiently... It has been. They've told it, us it is. I, so, I'm entertained by it. Yeah, so check it out. There's a lot of tiers. You can subscribe. You can become a, a 
patron of ours for only one dollar per month and you get probably two exclusive audio clips we just did one this morning and it's our second of the month so we're, you're, we're gonna over deliver on what we uh promise yeah we we hope to and if you want double to two bucks and you get a video version as well which yeah. once you once you go there it's kind of tough to go back also we just spoke about our live show if you are one of our patrons on Patreon, you will get a discount to the live show. There's a promo code password that you enter, which is secret. So uh, go on to our Patreon and check that out. Saves you money already. We're essentially giving you the money back, which in yeah. me saying it, yeah, it doesn't make sense. This is not a good business yeah. deal for us. <laughs> okay. So hopefully you enjoyed the episode with Jenny Siler. Let us know what you think on Twitter at CrawlspacePod. We're also on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. This is not a, a paid sponsor. I just want to thank you for bringing a holy donut to us from Portland, Maine, the famous holy donut. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, dip into that in a little bit after we dip into your book. Yes, which is an incredible book. It's called The Art of the Heist, Confessions of a Master Thief, which you co-wrote with Miles Connor. Yep. So tell us how you became to be so closely associated to Miles Connor. Well, so I started out writing fiction of the crime genre, and I was sort of casting around, thinking about sort of branching out into nonfiction. And I had just moved to New England, and my agent came to me, called me on the phone and said, hey, I have this story. It's this guy who'd like to tell his life story. He lives in Boston, and I was living in Portland, Maine at the time. Um, and, you know, my agent said, you know, maybe you should meet him and hear his story, and maybe you can tell it. So, Did you know anything about him before then? I did not know. Real, I had never heard of Miles Connor. I'm not from New England originally, so I didn't know who he was. I had, like most people, I had heard about, you know, the Gardner Museum and those sorts of things but um but i didn't know anything about miles no if you could sum up for our listeners who miles connor is in um you know in a in a, in a story about him uh maybe a synopsis of who is miles connor whoa that is so difficult <laughs> miles connor is so many people um i like what you said he's so many people Tell us like what peop what versions of like so we know he's a criminal. Right. One of the things we know he is. Um, what else is he? Um, he's a very, very smart man. Um, and a very a man who's very interested in his life. Um, since since writing this book with Miles, I've worked on other projects with people. And I guess the thing that really, that I'll never forget about Miles that really stands out about him is just how interested he was in uncovering the truth about his own life. Um, I've worked with a lot of other people who have kind of, I mean, we all have our own agendas about who we are. We all, you know, believe who we are and we believe our own stories. Um, but Miles was really genuinely interested in introducing me to his friends, introducing me to people who might not tell the story the same way he did, and really uncovering the truth about who he was. I mean, he was a dedicated son. His father was a policeman. Um, he's a, a avid art collector. I mean, he knows more about art and antiques than anyone I've ever met in my life. Um, he's smart. He's very funny. But there's something under the surface, you know, something going on there. I think when people start reading up on uh, Miles, I was surprised to find out that his father was a Milton police officer and he was raised in a, in, in uh, would you say, I mean, it was, uh, it was a working class family. This wasn't a family that needed to struggle. I mean, it was they, they provided, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've been to visit the house where he grew up, and, and it was a, a very sort of suburban um, upbringing. You know, his, his, I believe it was his mother's side of the family that was sort of, you know, vaguely connected to sort of the Boston upper crust. And his father was more of the, you know, working class cop 
Um, and he loved his mother very much. He dedicated the book to her. Um, right. Uh, but his his grandparents were the ones who really introduced him to art collecting, antiques collecting, fine art, taking him to the Museum of Fine Art. And yeah, he describes his childhood as very happy, just like a very sort of happy traditional childhood, you know. Okay, so your agent introduces you to Miles. You go and meet him. Did your agent tell you that he was uh, had le- lived a life of crime, or he just said, no, this guy wants to talk about his life? Yes. So my agent told me a little bit about him. Um, I mean, at the the of course, the hook for the for getting me involved and sort of getting everyone involved, I think, was the his connection to the Gardner heist. Um, Interesting. Yeah. But uh, um, but. So that was sort of, you know, that was my introduction to him, came through that. Um, But, and it wasn't until I actually met him and started talking to him that the actual story of his life that has nothing to do with the Gardner Museum, um, that I sort of got to know that story Mm -hmm. more. And that that story is absolutely fascinating and crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And it took place in the 50s and 60s. And... um, 70s and 80s. 70s and 80s. Yeah, yeah, going yeah. on up. It's, it yeah. really <laughs> still going on. Yeah. It really reads like a like a Scorsese book. Like bo- I know Scorsese doesn't do books, but the book reads like a Scorsese movie plays. Like it's um, right. It's like epic, right? So it spans 40 years about, yeah. um, and it goes through highs and lows w- with this guy who is um, a career criminal, but so much more than that, and you really kind of go through the emo- some of the emotions, I would say, um, with him when he's in jail the first time. It's like, you just, you, I just wanted him to get back out. It was like, oh man, I can't wait to see what Miles gets up to when he gets right. out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I just want to, um, I dare anybody who's going to read this book who hasn't re- read the book, uh, I dare you to get through the first chapter and not want to, and, and put it down. You can't do that. You know, don't, don't think I'll just read this first chapter. Because it's it's ridiculous. It's the right. Pringles of books. <laughs> it really it's Lay's potato chips. Oh, Lay's. Lay's sorry. <laughs> also not a sponsor. Also not a sponsor. <laughs> Yet. Uh, I just want to read uh, the um, the last paragraph of your uh, your introduction to the book, your your prologue to the sure. book. Uh, it says, "As incredible as it may seem, this is a work of fiction." I'm sorry. As incredible as it may seem, this is a work of fact, not fiction, with the exception of a small handful of incidents to which Miles himself is the only living living witness. The events described in this book have been painstakingly researched, carefully corroborated using newspaper accounts, eyewitness testimony, court records, and various other original documents. Um, For obvious reasons, though most names have been changed to protect the innocent or guilty as they may be. Other than that, the account you are about to read is true. So you you did an, an extensive job vetting all of the sources and all of the stories. Yes. Okay. I mean, I, um, f- well, f- one thing that everybody should probably know is that Miles, uh, bef- went during his last stint in prison, he was in federal prison before I met him, he suffered, nobody's really sure what happened. He either had a stroke or a heart attack or a combination of the two. And so there are small holes in his memory, which I think is part of what makes him so, um, eager and willing to find out sort of what to go back and really retrace what happened to him in an honest way. Um, He's very open to the fact that his memory about certain details might be off. And so he encouraged me and helped me find other sources to corroborate everything that had happened. He was very adamant about introducing me to people and letting me talk to other people who had been there um, letting me talk to people who had done the MFA heist with him, um, other heists who had been in prison with him. And, um, and I mean, as a, as a writer, that was very gratifying. You know, I don't like to write things that I'm not able to corroborate. And, and in Miles's case, it just is so incredible. I mean, I was going back and rereading parts of the book before sitting down with you guys today. And I just, I mean, I had two emotions. One was that it was the it's just so incredible. I I feel like in a way I sort of failed to adequately describe his life just because as as much as is in the book, there's so much that it just 
doesn't even come through. I mean, that is beyond what's in the book. Uh, and I was also sort of dismayed at just how it does sound. Some of it does sound unbelievable, you know, but the sure truth does. is that it's, it's all true. <laughs> I, I can vouch for that. In reading the book, you also kind of get a feeling like you know Miles, and it's like, oh, this is a good guy. Like, this is a guy I would want to hang mm-hmm. out with, and he's really funny and charming and uh, really intelligent, obviously. And, you know, he doesn't seem like he could be violent or, or harmful in any way. And also, I, I read, I felt like I read the book in a Cockney accent. I don't know why mm-hmm. that happened to me, but uh, it was just like, just like hit the voice that I right. read came came across like like uh, English. I know he's from Boston. No, though. I get that. I mean, he does have a little bit of an accent, and it's probably just a Boston accent, but it comes across as kind of a like an old movie accent, yeah. you know, a little bit. Um, what, who's what? the uh, who's the uh, the old gangster um, James Cagney? Yeah. Yes, like yeah, a yeah. J- very James much. Cagney type. Very much. Yeah. What went into the decision, or did you guys have a conversation about? whether to write it in first person or any other way? Yes, we did. Um, And, I I mean, I'm pretty sure that I was in favor of not writing it in first person. I wanted it to be a much more kind of journalistic story sort of approach to the the telling of the story. Um, There were just... You know, when you're when you're writing something like this, you don't you don't always get to make the choices as the writer, and and I think I mean I'm I'm happy with the final product. I think it was probably it's a very different book. You know, a, a third person book would have had um, would have had many more sources and would have probably looked at the story from many different angles. And in the end, it was really just his story. And so um, if we were just going to tell his story, it seemed like first person was the way to tell it. Right. And I think we've uh, teased the people who are listening um, quite a bit on his stories and, you know, what type of person he was. What type of person, what type of criminal was he? He was an old school criminal. You know, he, he came to criminality sort of by way of like martial arts and you know he he had this he has this very very sort of chivalrous attitude i mean i don't know if chivalrous is the right word but but he's very concerned with uh, loyalty and you know sort of this this code of ethics that really i mean i know i kind of repeat that over and over in the book but it's true he you know he has certain certain sort of lines that he won't cross you know civilians are never supposed to be harmed and um you know he's very he's very chivalrous to women and and all of the women I spoke with who and interviewed who had who were connected with him were always very always corroborated that you know that he was a really really kind person to them yeah (laughs) It's hard for people to wrap their heads around a career criminal having a code of ethics that's almost described as being Buddha-like and this um, this Zen way about him. And when it comes to you know his 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 crimes, he was was it 1970 or 1971 when he was uh, convicted of the the rape conviction happened, which I'll let you describe and how that affected him and that you know went completely against his criminal code of ethics right so he was so he had before he was a criminal I guess he was also a musician and he was a real um uh character sort of around the Revere Revere Beach he played a lot at Revere Beach um and he was this this musical character he had um a I don't know if it was it was some kind of large cat, like a leopard or a cougar that he would walk right. around Revere Beach with. And I mean, we're we are all too young, including myself, barely to remember that that kind of time of like just these goofy characters. You know, musicians were these goofy characters that walked around with with 
cougars and <laughs> <laughs> wore weird clothes and rode their mi- motorcycle onto the stage and you know and that's what he that's was. That's what he did. Yeah. That's what he did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And um and he was famous for that and he was also a really really good musician. Anyone who's heard him play is uh, or sing is it's pretty amazing. And his band was Miles and the Wild Ones. Miles or? and the Wild Ones. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Oh! To make a long story a little shorter, he sort of got butted heads with some of the, um, I think they were called the Metropolitan District Police, the mm-hmm. people who are supposed to. Yep. Yeah, so he kind of butted heads with a couple of guys on the MDC, and the way that he, um, the way that he tells it, they they basically set him up for this um, this rape charge, and he was. Uh, accused of raping an underage girl, I think 17-year-old girl. Um, and he, it, it was devastating for him. Not only was he accused, but he was convicted of the crime. And I don't think Miles has ever been afraid of being convicted of a crime, but to be convicted of that crime. I mean, his parents were both still alive at the time, and and it was just my, like a hugely crushing moment for him. He was later um, completely exonerated. Yeah. Acquitted. And was there, um, wasn't he given the option to plead guilty? Yes. So, and- he, yeah, he was already facing time in Walpole. This was the the first time, I think he was actually in prison when the, when the rape um, charges were brought against him. He was already in prison in Walpole for uh, some other crimes, um, bank robbery, I believe. And he... Um, and they gave him the option, the prosecutor gave him the option to p- just plead guilty to the rape and they would run the sentence concurrent with his uh, his other sentence. And he refused to to do that just because he didn't want to plead guilty to because a rape he, charge. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't guilty. Ended yeah. up being the right decision yeah. because he did yeah. get exonerated and wouldn't have In been able end. to appeal that's, that's had right. he pled that's right. guilty. That's right. Interesting. So the the... The code of ethics that he has comes around full circle. He just sticks with his gut, and his gut tells him right. what's the right thing to do. Morally. On the other hand, his I do think you know we I don't want to play down the fact that he's a criminal, you know, and he does things that the rest of us don't exactly think are good things to do. And and in the same respect, his code of ethics and did end up getting him into a lot of trouble in his life mm-hmm. because he really felt, you know, he felt this, this, um, uh, need, I don't want to say need, but he felt obligated to protect other people who are criminals or to, uh, you know, keep his word to when at times when he probably shouldn't have kept his word or. Right. Because there were moments where he got out of jail and started playing his music again and having real success. And then these characters from his life of crime would come back into his life. And he seemed like, or it seems like he just couldn't resist. Yeah. Partly due to feeling like he maybe owed them something and partly maybe due to just the excitement of crime and probably money too. Yes, I think both. And I think he would be the first to admit that he really just couldn't, can't resist Um, a few things. He can't resist the adventure. He can't resist. I mean, he loves to pull off these, these heists, these, any, anything, the bank robberies, the art heists. I mean, I think for him, the thrill of it is, is almost like an addiction. It's completely like he's powerless over his love of that, that excitement, you know? Um, And he's also really, is he's powerless over probably his love of collecting things. He loves art and antiques and, you know, and he, you know, so much of his, um, the profits from his bank robberies were used to buy things he really wanted to have. It's incredible. I think he says that, um, like, the two biggest thrills for him are walking through a museum when he shouldn't be there and just kind of having his way with it and also being on stage in front of, you know, and entertaining a bunch of people. And it's so funny because one is him completely alone with these like amazing historical 
artifacts and 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 works yeah. of art, right. and the other is the spotlight's on him and he's he's entertaining a bunch of people. Right. Like this duality that's yeah. But there's always I feel like in all of his heists there's always an element of showmanship, you know, even I mean if he if he's in a position to be a showman about his heist, he will be, you know. Um the MFA heist was a perfect <laughs> example. Yeah, let's talk about that. that. <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah, reference. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so he walks into the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in broad daylight in 1974. Was it? So, so either 74 or 75. I'm sorry. I can't remember the okay. exact date. That's okay. And he walks out with a Rembrandt. Yes. Or runs out probably yeah. more accurately. I like how we're saying that. Um, I mean, just having, just performing a heist on its, on, on alone is showmanship enough. Right. But the fact that he needs to, if he had the opportunity to be even more showy about it, he would do it. Yes. Well, and I also think even, and not to digress, because I would like to get back to the MFA, but even when he wasn't, the, even some of the some of the museum robberies that he pulled, even when they weren't happening, even when there were no witnesses, maybe. So like, for, he, for instance, there was one museum that he sort of robbed to get back at one of the curators there, because the curator snubbed him yep. and I think he always did feel that he was a little bit that that was that was sort of a general feeling for him you know that he was never quite good enough for these people but that he knew just as much if not more than they did about the art and antiques that they had and so you know even when he was sneaking in the middle of the night there was a little bit of like gotcha to the curators and uh, by the same token there were curators that he grew to love and who he would not whose museums he would not rob because he liked them so much right so um so we can talk more about the uh mfa heist i just want to read another uh piece here from your book about the mfa heist uh it's, uh, it starts off with um, that two unidentified men walked into the Museum of Fine Arts on April 14th, 1975, and walked out with a priceless Rembrandt as a matter of record. Such was the brazen nature of the heist that newspapers all over the world carried reports of it. But how exactly the thieves managed to slip away with the paintings without getting caught has been a mystery for over three decades. Until now. <laughs> that's why you that's why you can't not read on with this right, book. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. And Miles was very generous with uh helping me contact some of the other people who were involved in the heist with him. So I was really able to and again, this that the the MFA heist is a perfect example of something that just seems incredible. When I when I describe, you know, when it's described in the book, it almost seems like I can't adequately describe it because it's so uh, just just ballsy and you know, just it's like something from a movie. Yeah, it's you know? one of those sentences that just really sounds fake. It's like he right. walked in <laughs> during w while the museum, which is one of the biggest and best museums in the world. Right. He walks in during while well, it's open during the day and him and a friend and they walk out with this uh Rembrandt painting. They also had a they had a plan. Yeah. You know, that that's the real that's that's the real thing that's amazing is that they had planned it so carefully. Um, you know, and I without giving away too much, you know, their the real genius of their plan was that they knew exactly where they were going afterward. And so not only did they walk into the MFA in broad daylight, and I think it was a different time. I think 1975 was definitely a different time. You know, they, they chose the Fenway entrance because it was basically just a swamp back there. And, you know, and but they my, my favorite part of the whole the, all the planning is that they knew that they were going from the MFA directly to Bromley Heath, which was one of the worst housing projects in Boston at the time, and that pretty much nobody would follow them in there. And if they did, nobody would say anything about it. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> wow. And But it was for a purpose. He proceeds to negotiate a lesser prison sentence but for himself for himself right so that's the right. part that's absolutely like right. the twist in it in, in right. the line or paragraph that is absolutely incredible right to me. so he didn't just take the rembrandt because he wanted to take the rembrandt so so years earlier before the the theft of the rembrandt one of the very first big heists that he pulled off and i think 
I think this is accurate that it was actually one of the biggest personal thefts in the history of of the United States. Um, he and some friends robbed the Woolworth summer home in Maine, and they took um, millions of dollars in priceless paintings and antiques. And and actually, some of those, I mean, all of, ironically, that robbery, though many of the items that he took from that came back to haunt him at various times in his life, even years and years later. Um, but so he had stolen, there were, there were a few paintings, a few um, NCYF paintings that were especially valuable that he had taken. And he was set up um, in a sting with the FBI, the FBI set him up to fence a, a associate set set him up to try to fence some of these very valuable paintings with an FBI agent, and he was caught, and he was facing a very long prison term for having um, tried to fence these paintings, and he was having dinner with his family one night, and somebody mentioned. Well, nothing will get you out of this short of a Rembrandt. And he, of course, that got Miles to thinking. And he said, well, I know where there's a Rembrandt. <laughs> now, do you think that they said that to be literal? Or was it a, you know. It's an you, expression. It's an expression. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. You, need a, you, need, you need something so powerful right. you need a rembrandt right. and he took it as like i can get hmm. a rembrandt yeah hey there's an idea there's an idea <laughs> yeah. great idea yeah. so he actually stole i mean you can't there's really no reason to steal a very famous rembrandt painting from a museum like the mfa unless you're going to use it as a bargaining chip you can't sell it you can't you know i guess you could keep it in your house and stare at it if you wanted to but he stole it never having the intention to keep it always with the intention to use it as a bargaining chip to you know to appear and say hey i know where that rembrandt is i can get it back if you lower my sentence and it worked yes it did but it was really complicated i think there's a whole chapter devoted yep. to uh the intricacies of actually making this happen and it sounded like it took i think it took like six months for yeah from it beginning took months. To end. yeah because there were so many agencies involved there were um you know there was the fbi there were um you know local cops and he chose to use a friend of the family's um who worked for the Massachusetts State Police. So because Miles' father had been a Milton cop, he had friends who were also policemen, and this man was used to um, to bargain to bargain the the whole thing. And Miles was actually in jail by by the time I think they, he actually he was in at least in Charles Street. He was in jail by the time the whole whole bargain went through mm -hmm. so and you said uh the charles street jail yes which is now the luxury hotel the liberty hotel right. and you can hang out in their uh <laughs> restaurant that i think is called clink yep um also not a sponsor right. and uh you'd have no idea what type of facility that was back in the day right um, miles there miles talks a lot about that place yeah um i mean he and his friends spent a lot of time in the charles street jail and it was i guess just a horrible you know, vermin ridden place. I think it was actually closed down because it was uh, deemed to be like a violation of people's civil rights to keep them there. It was so bad. And this is his second stint in the Charles Street Jail. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Most most people don't get through like one stint in the Charles Street Jail. <laughs> right. But jail. he was in Walpole twice. And, so, and right. most people don't get through Walpole. Right. Walpole was, uh, I don't know if I well, will. I don't yeah. want to go down that road. Uh, the should we uh, the um, Boston Strangler story? Well, that's one of my favorite parts <laughs> of the book. Uh, yeah. it, it's sort of like the mo one of the most visual parts of the book is when uh, Miles is describing this uh, right. concert uh, sort of picnic thing in the yard All right. of, the, of Walpole All right. Prison. So Miles's recollections of and what was his what was Al De Salvo? I think is yes. the guy's name Albert De Salvo. So one of the things that Miles one of my favorite things that Miles talked about about the Charles Street or about Walpole, his time in Walpole, was being in there with Albert DeSalvo, who was convicted as being the Boston Strangler. 
Um, and uh, Miles's friends also talk so fondly about Aldo Salvo. And it was, I don't know, it just was just a goofy, you know, it's just one of those, those like crazy things I couldn't resist putting in the book. Because he, he was, they, nobody really thought he was actually the Boston Strangler. Right. So he wasn't a super threatening guy in prison, at least. In prison, he wasn't. Mm-hmm. He was kind of like a mild mannered. I mean, they almost make it sound like he was maybe sort of slow or, you know, just mm-hmm. not really all there and that he had somehow been, you know, made to believe that he had done these things or, right. um, and he, yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. One is that he he ran like a little ice cream truck in the prison yard. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, like, and he sold hoodsies. They all talk about him <laughs> selling so his hoodsie weird. cups, you know. And um, and so everybody liked him because he had the ice cream truck. I mean, clearly at the time, Walpole was a very. We, I think prison was in the 70s was obviously a very different place than we think of it today, you know. Well, th- this this visual, this moment that that Miles and and you <laughs> describe in in the book is I, I believe he's on stage playing a concert right. out in the prison yard and there had been um visitors bust in from an old age home. Right. Well, so Miles was the, yeah, they would have these concerts on Sundays in the yard. And Miles was actually his job. Like some people had to go make license plates or go in the laundry. And he was the director of, um, uh, a mu- you know, like fun, fun director, <laughs> like the cruise director at Walpole, uh, entertainment director. But so his friend Al Dottley, who was also his band manager, had this idea to bring in these all the people who were living in this old folks home that was near Walpole for one of their Sunday concerts. And yes, and Miles, t- one of his sort of favorite stories about Walpole is Alda Salvo, the convicted Boston Strangler dancing with these elderly ladies at one of his concerts. Do you mind if I read that? <laughs> Please. It's real quick. So from your book, it says, uh, Al Dottley still has an old home movie from that day, which he shot, that shows DeSalvo grinning like a madman, his arms thrown over the shoulders of two elderly women who, I'm certain, had no clue they were dancing with a notorious serial killer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. It's, it's, like, it's like the... Uh, I think it, <clears throat> it's like a moment like that, though, in the book that kind of really endears Miles to a reader, though, um, because he kind of takes this step back and he's like, wait a second, this whole scene right now is crazy. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm playing music in the prison yard and the convicted Boston Strangler is dancing with these right. uh, two older ladies who are grinning ear to ear. He's selling ice creams. Everyone's having right. a blast. <laughs> right. What the fuck is going on? And, and you're, ta- you're coming from uh, like... Uh, Miles's history of, you, you know, these heists and actually uh, coerting with uh, uh, other known criminals, and and it says, uh, you know, well, first of all, now when you look back at Albert DeSalvo, and you know, he's this notorious serial. Because there's some right. people say that he did it, some people say that he didn't right. do it. I could see where the sense of humor comes from from a seasoned criminal yes. who's got a code of criminal ethics, and and then looking at this guy and just shaking your head and laughing. Right. Yes. I also thought it was really interesting about DeSalvo and, um, of course, Miles. But uh, during the prison riot at Walpole, right. Miles and, and you in the book described uh, Albert DeSalvo as kind of just hiding. Yes. And like he didn't join any side of this prison. He just hid alone. Right. Which, which I think sort of it agree, sort of is... It makes sense in terms of the way that everybody talk, who was in mm. prison with him talks about him. I mean, he seems like he was a very vulnerable person, which I don't think means that he couldn't have been a serial killer. Sure. I think I think they could easily go hand in hand. Um, he was just, yeah, after the Attica riots, there were riots at Walpole. And, um, and, you know, Miles talks about a lot about how terrifying it was for a lot of the prisoners who really relied on there being some element of control not to be killed themselves, you know, mm-hmm. and, and DeSalvo was one of those people that seemed especially vulnerable. Susceptible. Yeah. I, I could absolutely see that. It made a lot of sense um, in reading the book. Now, one of the other lines or, or paragraphs uh, that also seems unbelievable is there was this, I think it was a week long prison riot at Walpole that Miles negotiates the end of. 
Right. Or and, helps to, at least. Right. And to me, the craziest part of that is that he, Miles was not someone who was, or the way he tells it, he was not someone who was involved in prison politics at all. Um, but he was a member of the JCs, the Walpole chapter of the JCs, which to me is just kind of crazy that there was even a chapter of the JCs, which is like a civic. Uh, organization for young entrepreneurs, I think, or something like that. So, because um, every criminal is an entrepreneur, right. <laughs> but a lot of the people in his book were JCs. So, but so he was, um, so he was asked sort of to come in as because of his role with the JCs to to help negotiate a standoff, the standoff between the prisoners and the authorities. But he was asked because he was so liked by both sides, which yeah. is, you know, just totally fascinating. Speaks to his character. And he is very likable. Yeah. He presents himself in a very likable way. So, that doesn't mean he's not a little scary, too. <laughs> actually, that's one of the questions I had. Were, were you scared at any point um, in working with him and writing this? No, never. Never, ever. And he allowed you um, access to the inner circle of certain crime I guess you could say syndicates. Was that something that was? Uh... Yeah, I mean, there were times when I was meeting people and then I was just sort of realizing after the fact who I was meeting and what I was doing. Oh, so he never told you, hey, I'm going to, this is. Yeah, know, he Bobby would just say, like, who... like, we're going to go and have lunch in Quincy with these people, <laughs> you know? And then after the fact, you'd sort of be like, oh, okay, that's who I was meeting. Yeah. Like, like connected members of yeah okay yeah and you heard stories so you sat and had lunch with these with Miles and 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 these other these other criminals yes and you never felt like this was any like danger no no I'm Amazing. a little bit like of a like a Jessica Fletcher character you know like nobody's really gonna harm me I'm I'm just an unintimidating <laughs> lady you know <laughs> I like that <laughs> like the Miss Marple Jessica Fletcher edge you know. Never, never a, a bad time for a murder she wrote reference. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the story about when he took the SAT exam in oh, right. prison and aced it, and then these two professors, I believe from Harvard, said, mm, there's no way he did this without cheating. Mm -hmm. And they brought him to Harvard and under close observation made him take the test again, and he scored even higher. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's he's just genius. He's this genius level. I mean, obviously he's a criminal and he used most of his uh, talents for that. But he's this genius guy who probably could have excelled in absolutely anything he tried. Yes. Well, and he taught. I mean, right after that, he was he applied to the University of Massachusetts, got in, got out of prison, and I think he went to the University of Massachusetts for like less than a week and dropped out. It just, he just, you know, it, it just wasn't fun enough. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's what I told my parents that, that uh, I was too smart for school and this is like too boring <laughs> for me and I should just be out there doing stuff. And then you uh, lowered yourself into the uh, children's museum <laughs> by way of rope. No, no. Then, then I went back to school the next day. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, in a weird way, there's an element of tragedy to Miles too, in that you, you know, you can see uh, all this potential that's sort of squandered, you know, and and I think he he probably even sees that a little bit. He had so many. There were so many points in this book where you could say, okay, this is a this is a moment where he can decide to go legit. Right. And he could have had a, a great life playing music. Right. Um, being famous playing music. Yes. Uh, and he just couldn't resist the life of crime. Right. Well, and you can see that in his relationship with Al Dottley, who's Al is really one of the best, nicest people, stand up guy I've ever met. And he is devoted to Miles and he saw that potential. Even as a teenager, even when they were teenagers together, Al saw that that amazing potential in Miles. And I think, I mean, this is just my opinion, but I'm sure that it's been, you know, it's it's probably been a frustration for him seeing this person that he truly loves as a friend, you know, not fulfill that p potential. So, so it's not like he was just some local, uh, like, uh, 
cover artist, you know, who just like filled the bar because people were there to drink and hear these popular songs they knew. He wrote original music and played original things and yes. would have been or could have potentially been to that level uh, of those mu- musicians. Yes, I think so. Well, he was part of the. There, I can't imagine how many cover songs he would have been able to play when those cover when those songs weren't even written at the time anyway. Mm, true. I mean, right. he is writing these songs, and he does. You know, he was covering the songs that um, were around at the time. But he had the leather jacket, and like you said, the motorcycle on stage wrote the you know wrote it right up on stage. He created. He, yeah, part he, of that rock and roll. Yes, yeah, yeah, he helped yeah. to mold. Yes. The, yeah, 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 and, and that is. was the you know the his the Shanana guys who also came out of that same area. You know, he was, you know, they were often in each other's bands, and you know, so it was a similar. If you're familiar with them, it's kind of a similar aesthetic to that. So I want to go back real quick to um, the summer of 1965 when he breaks out of the prison in uh, the Hancock uh, County Jail in Ellsworth, Maine. Right. If people think that these things don't happen, right? I mean, it sounds like a joke, but tell us, tell us how he broke out of prison. Right. Well, well, that was my really my first actual. I had met Miles. I had come driven down to Boston and met him when we were when we were talking about working on the book together. But the the Hancock County Jail story was really my first. Real, the first real time I spent with Miles. Um, and I had still hadn't really decided to take on the project, but I wanted to spend some some really quality time with him and look at, you know, some of these stories and see, and again, you know, hearing them myself, I couldn't believe that they were true. So, and so he had told me this story about breaking out of this little jail in Maine. And I didn't, you know, I was like, oh, I don't know. But I was living in in Maine at the time. So I said, Miles, why don't you come up to Maine and we'll go up there. We'll look around. We'll see what's what. And I really wanted to try to corroborate his story with my, you know, with firsthand just seeing, seeing the place, seeing if he described it correctly, seeing if we could find anything. So he came up to Portland and we drove up to Ellsworth together. Um, we drove and he, so he, in his story, he was, um, uh, robbing this old woman's house, like on the main, up in the middle of nowhere on the main coast. Uh, he was caught by the police. They sent him to the jail in Ellsworth. Um, he broke out using a soap gun. He carved a gun out of a bar of soap and, um, colored it with boot polish right we we all know this story it's a famous story from john dillinger john dillinger yep and i think it's in a woody allen movie too right only in the woody allen movie it rains outside right it starts to suds up (laughs) right so miles had told me this story before we went up there and i was just i was like there's no (laughs) way there is no way that this is true no way. Like he saw this in a movie and he's telling me the story now, you know, so this was this was in a way it was like a make or break thing with me. If this panned out, I would do the book, you know, kind of in my mind. And I really did not expect it to pan out. So we go up there together and he had, you know, part of it, part of the story is that he dives into the river afterward and he swims across the river and we get up there and the river is kind of not as deep as he remembered it. And it's not, you know, it's. I'm like, I don't know this guy, you know, and so we're walking around together and we go to the old jail, which is now, you know, he remembers the jail. It's now the historical society. It's an old kind of Victorian brick building, you know, just typical like small town New England jail. So we're walking around, it's closed, there's nobody there, you know, and I'm I in my mind, I'm sort of starting to like, okay, this is just, you know, he can't. It, nothing looks exactly the way he thought it, you know. And as we're we're sort of getting ready to leave, and this man comes comes out of the building, and we approached him and we we tell him what we're doing there, and he says, "Oh yeah," he says, "My, uh, my father or grandfather was one of his family members was the warden at the jail." He says, oh, yeah, I remember that story. He said that soap gun was in the historical society for years and somebody stole it not long ago. (laughs) So at that point, I was like, "Okay, that's true. You know, unbelievable, but true. 
was that the most unbelievable thing that he told you that you found out was true? That was probably. I mean, that's really the. That's really insane. You know the the. <laughs> The, I mean, there were other things like the, I mean, the soap gun's just so crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, how how does that even happen, that you overpower someone with a soap gun? I mean, there were, like, the back bay shootout. Mm. Um, and then the aftermath of that when he's in the hospital yes, is yeah, absolutely yeah, bonkers. Yeah. And so reading, like... You know, ha- having him tell me about the back bay shootout and then reading about it in the paper, reading that same details, and, you know, it, that was... That was pretty amazing. I want to, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we can actually confirm that he said this, but when, after he really, you know, was able to uh, fool the guards with the soap gun and he was on the way out, he dropped the soap gun or it was like knocked out of his hand or something. And he yelled, back, you can wash your face with that. Right. <laughs> and I mean, who knows if that's Miles telling me, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, I love yeah. it. He totally said it. He totally yeah, said it. I totally he probably believe did. that he said he it. He probably did. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to remember, this is the same guy who would, like, jump off stage. It, it's all just showmanship, you know? And in his acts, like, at the end of his act, they would jump off the stage and they would hold their guitars like machine guns and pretend to spray the crowd. And I think it all just comes from the same place, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the Back Bay shootout is... Along the rooftops in that neighborhood. But it ends there at least. And it ends, ends right, there. it ends That's there. That's right. And he's shot how many times? I can't remember. I mean, I want to say a dozen times or something. As he's climbing up the building, the fire escape, and then he's on the roof. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting, because the cops at that time had it out for him, obviously. Right. And they're literally kicking the shit out of him on top. And he's been shot. He's shot in his abdomen, right? Yes, and that, yes, yeah. yes. And, and they were about to throw him off the roof. And he did right. That's the that's what I was gonna say. He did something right. really smart. He starts yelling down at the crowd that had started They're to gather. They're throwing me off. The, yeah, I'm yeah. not falling. They're throwing yeah. me, yeah. which stopped the police officers from yeah. murdering. Well, and and him. also, I mean, he Miles really talks about that. There was a fireman. There was a, right. a fireman who came and said and told them to leave him alone. And yeah. he he talks about that guy a lot. You know. But Miles also shot a cop to get into that situation. That's right. State Police Corporal John O'Donovan, and they pretty much had this standoff. And uh, he says a bullet whizzed past his ear, uh, barely missing the mark. Panicked, O'Donovan raised his gun to fire. He says, our eyes met, and I looked oh, at right, him as right, if right. to say, I don't want to do this, but I have no choice. I fired on him, intentionally aiming to knock him down, not to kill him. Uh, then turned and fled into the building, taking the stairs, et cetera. And that's when the actual chase starts. Now, he does ask right before he, you know, right before the police start assaulting him on top of the roof, um, he does ask how the cop was. The, yes. Right. He, well, he, he says asked, he asked that. Yeah, he says, he, how's the cop <laughs> I shot? He says he asked that. What are your thoughts on Miles' involvement in the murders and disposal of Susan Webster and Karen Spinney? Um... Well, Miles was acquitted of, you know, the the crime. He was found to be not guilty of having been involved in the murder of the girls and and I I have no doubt that many of the people who spoke up against him had ulterior motives. You know, that was a very very dirty case. Mm-hmm. Um it's a horrible, you know, it was a horrible, horrible crime. Yeah. And it was, you know, that that crime, whether he was exonerated or not, kind of shadowed him forever after that. Yeah, I could see that. Um, but it's your it's your belief that he had no involvement, like he says in the book. Um, I... I was able to read a lot of the testimony that the the I do think that the definitely a lot of the the people who who said he was involved in the first place did not have good you know that they were lying or mm-hmm. I mean there were so many things that people said that were completely outlandish yeah like saying that he had killed his friend Ozzy de Priest and saying you know just just um saying all sorts of things Mm -hmm. so but so yeah that's my that's my answer 
Yeah, I I chose when reading it definitely chose to believe uh, that he was not involved in that. It seemed way too dirty uh, of a crime. It, right. it seemed like completely contrary to the rest yeah. of his crimes. I mean, I really do see those guys and Spira- I mean, Stokes is more of a hanger, uh, more of a just kind of going along. I think with what. Speraza wanted him to do but you know Speraza is kind of like the devil on Miles's shoulder you know and he's the he re- you know you can see I mean we talked about that already you can sort of see Miles in his life torn between doing something constructive and something destructive with his life and and those guys definitely represent the the destructive side and you know they took him down with him I hated it. I hated the way it took over the book and everything. And it did. It took over the book, you know, because it's like he has to constantly clear his name. Yeah. Yeah, at that part in the book, it kind of feels like Miles gets beaten down. And you kind of, as the reader, kind of feel it. Like it almost feels like you're yeah. walking through mud or something like that. And it's kind of like this it's is exhausting. Yeah, this is icky. And it's like this is yeah. this is a shadowed part in this guy's life. And you can tell. Um, and and it's, he's not kinda, innocent in it either. Right, completely. not completely innocent yeah. no matter what. And uh, so it it's kind of one of those things you're like, I hope this really doesn't taint my vision of this guy because he seems like a, a stand-up guy other than the, <laughs> the, you know, the innocent uh, uh, cr- uh, artwork and things like that. But it is with a sense of like, you know, kind of doom that you – get to that point and you think, well, it had to have caught up to him somehow. You know, all of this, right. you can't keep going like this without it catching up to you somehow or at least on the level of like it's bringing you down. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you're going to, you know, stoop to the level of, you know, those around you that don't have such a code. Yeah. I liked his uh, line here um, at the end about no man's life is merely a sum of its parts. And then he says, uh, there's no scale on which to set the thrill of holding a Rembrandt in one's hands no stick by which to measure the cheers of 600 men in the Walpole Prison Auditorium. I just love that he makes that comparison. It's it's incredible. Okay, let's get into some Gardner Heist specifics uh, Mm -hmm. here. My my question is, my first question about this is, so in the book it says, is it Houghton? David Houghton or Houghton? Houghton. Houghton, okay. That's how Miles always says it. Oh, okay. So. so in the book, David Houghton, uh, who is an associate of Miles's, he comes to visit Miles in prison. He right. t- told him that they robbed the gardener f- to help negotiate him out of jail. Right, basically, yep. How did you verify that? Well, that's one of the things that only Miles says it's understandable to make the connection between miles and the gardner museum heist because this is a museum that he had cased right and he and again he says that was it either it was either houghton or donati that he had uh i think i think david was the more if i'm remembering correctly bobby donati was sort of the more experienced of the two and David Houghton was more kind of just kind of a friend. He he wasn't a criminal himself. He was sort of he knew all these guys from Milton. I mean, they he knew them from childhood. And he had David had had a big crush on Miles's sister actually. And uh so he kind of wanted to be part of it, but he wasn't. And they all sort of according to Miles everybody kind of protected him and kept kept him, you know, they would occasionally call him in to do something that they thought would be easy and that he wouldn't get too involved with. Um, So, but I think it was Miles and Bobby Donati that went to the Gardner Museum a number of times together, walk through. And again, this is one of those things where those guys are both dead. So Right, they died shortly after the Gardner heist. Right. Uh, Some would call those deaths suspicious. Yep. And I think it's uh, interesting that uh, when Miles's friend ha- Al had the uh, was about to make the exchange of the Rembrandt years earlier, you know, people 
Raymond Patriarca came to him and offered him money for the for the painting. And you know, so people are interested in these paintings. If somebody knew that Donati and Houghton had that painting or, or had the Gardner paintings, they might be interested in those too. Miles's name comes up with the Gardner heist among law enforcement uh, pretty much immediately after it right. happens. And so much so that uh, Miles was in federal custody in Illinois, correct? Miles yes, was in federal custody in right. Illinois. But uh, according to the book, so strong was the FBI's suspicion that Connor was somehow involved that one of the first actions they took was to place a call to the superintendent of the, of the jail where Connor was being held, asking him to confirm that Connor, who had a history of daring prison escapes, was still in his cell, which he was. Right. So he, his name, com- the, the museum's robbed. His name comes up amongst law enforcement. They say he's in he's he's in custody in Illinois, and then someone goes, eh, "Are you maybe sure? Maybe we should check on that." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's his reputation. Right. I yeah. I could I would love to have been there in the room when the superintendent of the jail gets the call and he says, "No, it's my jail. Of, of course, I would know if he escapes." Right. And then they say, "Just go check." Right. <laughs> he, yeah. He he yeah. escaped before with a bar of soap. Go right. check. <laughs> so, yeah. what has Miles told you about the Gardner paintings? Um, I mean, Miles has never seen them. Does you know he he doesn't as as far as I know at the time that we wrote that we worked on the book together. He, you know, did not know where they were. Did not. Um, but he was always pretty convinced that you know these guys did it. He was always convinced that Donati and Houghton had yes. some involvement because yes. he had cased uh, the gardener with Donati. And Donati, now in the book, per Miles, I, I take it, Donati pointed out the eagle uh, finial and yep. said, I want I want that. And he said, I'll, I'll, that'll be my calling card. Yep. I'll be the if I eagle. ever do it, you'll know. Right. Because I'll take that. And now that eagle finial is not a valuable piece necessarily. It's got no. like it's like ten thousand dollars, something like that, or less maybe. But the only you know that that isn't stolen to sell. That isn't that that could potentially be stolen to show like some proof of life that I have these other paintings right. that I could see, um, or it could be stolen as a calling card. Right. But really, what are you going to do with that? I know. Other than it being a calling card. Right. Yeah. Something you liked. Yeah. I mean, so obviously so many pe- some of the other pieces that were taken that night were clearly just it's such a random collection of things. Well, the the two things that seem extremely random on on the surface that would be the finial and the the Chinese vase, the ku. But when you look at the people behind it, you have one saying that it's this will be my calling card and then you have somebody else telling miles we did this to get you out of prison right. and that and he was a big collector of asian art yes he was so that could be <laughs> something where it's a hey I, I got this asian art for you right totally yes yep yeah. it seems likely to me to be honest that, yeah that those two guys actually had that involvement i mean and you know and and obviously meeting you and speaking to you and, and you know miles well but uh reading the book you believe the things that he writes the things that you write in the book that he tells you so it's it's almost hard for me to believe or even think that he's lying about right. it. right I mean I always this is what I always say about Miles in the book I was not able to corroborate every single thing that Miles told me but everything that I was able to corroborate proved to be true <laughs> so I was never I never caught him in you know, there maybe there were details that over the course of 20 or 25 years he had forgotten. But every time I spoke with someone or found a newspaper article or it always corroborated everything he was telling me. So, you know, yes, those those unfortunately, it's, you know, a lot of the the stuff about the Gardner Museum is just kind of he's the only one left who who can say Um but you know it's clearly this was done there's so there's so many weird coincidences that do make you kind of wonder i mean you know there's miles loved the whole disguise thing and he would have loved the thing about dressing up as cops mm-hmm. he would have loved that 
Um, he, you know, the fact that the security guard was a was a musician and played in clubs and, you know, that they could have all somehow crossed paths at some point. Um, hmm. It feels to me like he loved planning. He, he every everything that uh, all of his escapades that you break down in the book, um, he seems to take pride in the plan. Yes. Right down to the, the, the so. soap gun where he was like, the plan was simple. And that was the thing, like keep the plan simple. Yes. Yep. No, he was a good planner. <laughs> the plan was simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's one of those crazy. I, I mean, who knows? Maybe no one will ever know. You know, I mean, of course, Miles never would have allowed somebody to cut the paintings the way they did. Right. He never would have agreed to that. And Donati knew enough about art where he wouldn't. It seems like he wouldn't have done that as well and he right. learned from miles and they knew a lot about art uh it definitely seemed like bobby donati n- knew that that would really injure the value and he I, w- I could see him not doing that yeah especially if your plan was i mean if your plan was to to use it as a bargaining ship the other thing is why just take why not just take one why take more than one you know if, if that's your plan you know I mean, that maybe that who knows? It's such all, all of its speculation. I mean, they could have taken the other paintings for, you know, for to sell and just, you know, well, as long as we're here, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, what does Miles think? What, does he has he given you any insight on where he thinks the paintings are now? Um, I've so I've talked to a few people, it you know, in Miles's world about where they think they are. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the conclusion that they all have is pretty anticlimactic. Um, you know, a, a, the consensus seems to be that the that the paintings probably are destroyed or lost. Um, you know, I talked to one person who kept, who was in possession of a painting that Miles had stolen. And once a very you know a very valuable painting and this person talked about the experience of having that painting in in his possession and and the just the intense feeling surrounding having that painting and and paranoia and fear and um i mean just listening to this person talk about what it was like to be sort of the guardian of this huge piece of art. That person's conclusion is that whoever had the Gardner paintings could have easily become terrified or paranoid or, you know, delusional and thrown them away, thrown them in a lake somewhere or just burned them. Yeah, I mean, who that uh, that's extreme. I think that's the most extreme theory. But this this person who had a painting himself once upon a time truly believes that that's what he would have done. Yeah, there's always the human element, right? It's uh, you say, well, why would someone, you know, destroy these paintings? But the human element is like, well, that that person has uncontrollable paranoia regarding this, and you would never be able to guess what he would do. Right. And when, yeah. And I just think when so many people are looking for something and I mean, you say, well, why wouldn't you just leave it somewhere? Why wouldn't you just, I don't know. When you were talking to Miles about it, did he ever express any anger about how the paintings, because you said he, he would never uh, be the one to like sink a razor blade and then cut them out of the frame. Um, did he, did he tell you that? Or did he ex- ever express any Anger I mean, not anger, Witcher. but like anyone who really appreciates fine art. I mean, that's it's a tragedy, you know, and I think he sees it that way for sure. Yeah. Uh, as a tragedy. Do you think he has any incentive to lie about these stories about Bobby Donati and David Houghton? No, absolutely not. I mean, there's no reason to, right? He's no. not getting he's not going to collect a reward. Nope. There's no the, other than that showmanship is, potentially. The, the Donati and Houghton story is definitely what he believes to be the truth. Okay. What my or I don't I don't know at this moment in time, but when I spoke to him about it, it was definitely what he believed to be true. Right. That they Be- had taken the paintings. 
because why wouldn't it be right it's it's so close to a plan that he right had formulated Mm -hmm. and he had already robbed the mfa i mean he he was within the circle of these known criminals so right it probably just seemed to make sense when he heard about it oh they finally did it and they they houghton and donati were two of the people who saw miles steal this rembrandt from the mfa and negotiate a lesser sentence for himself and oh look two rembrandts are stolen from the gardner museum right and who knows there might have been somebody else behind it too you know what i mean there might have been it might be so complicated that it's like somebody else miles yeah not saying that that's our particular theory, but you can see where he can uh, come from as far as this is what I believe. Not yeah, saying that definitely. we're pushing this as you know as as fact, but it's totally reasonable to see that he he believes it. What's your relationship now with Miles? I get a Christmas card from him every year. Stop it. <laughs> They always have a little, like, goofy, something goofy on them. I have not seen him for a few years, but I feel like I can call him and say hi and talk about my life. He asks me how my kid's doing and all that stuff. 